Yes. Yes, we can definitely do a minimum, and that's sort of the other side of the scale when we set the dollar amount. We could use up to, or we could use a minimum of X amount up to a maximum, or a minimum allows council to do anything above and, and beyond that amount. So most certainly either one would work. Okay, that's what I was thinking when I first suggested the sanction. Okay, let's go around the table. Ali. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I prefer the wording of a minimum percentage with then um, flexibility left for the remaining funds to be used if we do need more in a certain area that year. Yeah, I would support the, the allocations based on percentages and working as Councilman McMaster pointed out the minimum percentages. Um, and, and I'm curious, uh, the, the one area that I've I need time to reflect on everything that's been presented here before I have more fulsome questions. But in terms of, I would like to see debt servicing, and I think specifically the recreation facility, where we don't know what the final bill will be. And I'm just curious as to, uh, I want to ensure that uh, we have the flexibility to be able to use this uh, allocation uh, to finance that debt. And if it um, is higher than uh, what we might be expecting uh, revenues from, I, I want to be flexible enough to be able to uh, service that debt through uh, the pay parking uh, revenues. And, and I, I'm not sure I fully understand if that mechanism would be could be enshrined uh, in this particular option. So. Um, that being said, that, that would take care of one of the other things that I was concerned about. I, I would have liked to have seen some usage to lower taxation, uh, and this would be a way um, of doing that so that we, if, if that debt amount was higher than the allocation, we would, have, of course, have to go to taxation to service that debt further. Um, so I want to ensure that that wouldn't be the case um, if we could. So I know it's probably not, uh, it's just a, a sidetrack on this, but I want to ensure that that ability would be taken care of. Otherwise, I support the uh, those options percentage-wise allocated, uh, whatever it uh, might be if it was at 50%, without knowing the costs of, of the rec facility and the potential debt servicing down the road. It's, it's hard for me to make an exact comment. Thank you. Through the chair, Councillor Steer, yes, debt servicing would be could be listed as, as an eligible use in any reserve fund. And there's no um, maximum to how much we could utilize towards debt servicing. So if we were to um, have a reserve fund established for recreation facilities, both indoor and outdoor, we could indicate that the cop capital costs associated with building, and I'm just making up language on the fly, indoor and outdoor recreation facilities would be eligible, as well as debt servicing for recreation facilities, both indoor and out outdoor. So if we were to obtain debt, then that debt servicing would be an eligible use and we'd ensure that that language was quite clear in the bylaw. And, and if, through the chair, yeah, and, and if, maybe where my confusion lies is that, uh, so if that debt servicing exceeded um, that potential percentage allocation, um, that would be my concern. Uh, I would like maximum flexibility within there. Does that make sense? Um, I know it would be an eligible use to be able to use the funds for debt servicing, but if if there was a maximum amount that uh, that was allocated to that and the debt servicing was higher, um, then we would have to go to taxation um, to make up that debt servicing, potential debt servicing deficit. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So what I would, okay. So without knowing what debt servicing would be on a future yeah. facility, um, that would be the reason why we would establish the percentage allocations in policy rather than bylaw. And then those policies can be revisited as our as our capital or debt servicing needs would change. That would be something that would come through the CFO and likely through the annual financial planning process. Great, thank you. Stella? Yeah, I, I like the, um, the percentage allocation, but um, my concern was is with with the 10%, do we know how much the actual cost of the paid parking implementation is costing? Is 10% enough for that? 
So I was not uh, suggesting or recommending okay. those percentages. 10% um, did come up during yeah. our discussions, but I think just in the same way that I'm bringing it up quite loosely, okay. um, with 3.5 million projected over the next five years, that's sort of an indication of what we'd be looking at. I think that these reserve funds are going to be established and looked at in terms of a long-term financial need and approach and sustainability. So if you take 3.5 million and, and just sort of factor in what that might look like for roads over the next five years, does that feel like a like a suitable position and, and a utilization of the of the surplus funds from paid parking? Keeping in mind we do we do tax the levy and do have other sources of funds for roads, but it has been clear through every planning process that it's just not it's not sufficient. And then I think like if we did set a minimum, what would happen if we never, we didn't require the funds in that area for the minimum? Would it go into a fund? And so this is a, it's something that did come up in, in the last discussion. And what I will caution council about is if we are going to establish a reserve fund for a very specified purpose, like recreation facilities, we should establish we should establish a reserve fund for something that will likely always be a need for the municipality. Uh, I can't see recreation going away or the need for roads and renewal going away and the cost of those are, are ever increasing. So I think it's fairly safe to say that establishing as a reserve fund, if we were to pick those two, um, we would we would be fairly safe in that regard. By having a more general reserve for paid parking surplus funds that list multiple uses, similar to how we have our amenity reserve fund policy, it gives us the flexibility and the future flexibility to use it for any any one of those purposes, and then then we're not restricted in terms of one use only. I yeah, I think everything's kind of been covered and um, giving feedback on. I like the idea of the percentages. I think that works. And I think my understanding of having the the kind of multi-use reserve is that if say the rec center is going to be so expensive, then we could take from that and add that into the rec facilities. Yeah, then that works great for me. That allows us some flexibility while still making sure that we take care of the priorities that we mapped out. Oh. Um, if, I guess the only thing that I would add um, is uh, I, I always hear that whenever we talk about rec facility, the certain amount of Tofino uh, citizens feel like rec recreation focused on sports kind of squeezes out uh, opportunities for development of recreation in arts and culture. Um, I'm just wondering then if we did have a reserve fund, uh, would it be, would that reserve fund for rec facility be tied to that particular rec facility that we're looking at now? Or could it be used, say, to, um, if we wanted to improve the community hall um, or other? types of recreation activities or we want to put in classrooms or workshop space or or whatever that would facilitate other types of recreation would would that uh, be flexible enough or would it be totally geared towards this sports oriented rec facility that we're now looking at through the chair to councillor anderson um, maybe I'll speak a little bit about process in terms of what the next steps would be if council makes a decision on percentage allocations and on a, sort of the general categories that we've talked about. Um, I think we need to do some work on further defining what recreation and what those facilities, the, the use of those facilities and what they would mean for council before we establish the specific language in the bylaw. So what, count, what staff can do, and I'm hearing all of your comments today and taking notes, is that we will craft language based on the discussion to date, but we'll bring it to a committee of the whole meeting for council's first consideration and just make sure that we do have the language right. If we want to include anything in the description of those eligible uses, then we can certainly do that at that time. So for today, purpose of today's discussion, I'm just looking for general support for these categories and then we'll get to work on crafting some language. 
I, I generally support <laughs> categories and um, I'm in agreement on minimums, I think, is the best way to go and provide. Uh, some, we want some certainty that those reserve funds are dedicated, and but we want flexibility as well. Hey, something. Heard enough? I have, and if I may, I just may put the presentation up for a moment and just go to the recommendation regarding percentages um, that I've drafted, and it would be um, probably good to get some formal direction from the Committee of the Whole. Can I use it? Okay, I didn't want to press it too soon. Okay, so for percentages, um, yeah, I haven't included the language up to or minimum of or anything like that, but we can certainly do that. And I've left the percentage amount out entirely. So what this recommendation does is it mirrors the option I suggested. Um, so we would receive the authorization to allocate surplus funds on the following annual basis. From this, we would bring back policy and bylaw for council to consider. So it would be X percentage to recreation facilities, and we can just include at a minimum of X percentage to recreation facilities, indoor and outdoor, including debt servicing, by introducing a recreation facilities reserve fund bylaw. And then the second one would be a minimum of X percent to the existing roads infrastructure reserve fund. And then the balance, if council chooses the balance, or maybe we just stick with those two categories, could go to a paid parking reserve fund bylaw. And I can bring forward some of the eligible uses that were talked about and highlighted through council's discussion, and we can finalize those together through a committee of the whole. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Now, I'm just I'm just wondering, um, in terms of uh, one of the things I, I, I want to make sure that we're careful about is uh, not constraining future councils, and um, maybe maybe you could explain what might be the pros and cons uh, to to this in terms of not quote hamstringing because uh, strategic priorities may change with different councils. So I, I just want to be cautious of. of not constraining them in the future. Thank you, through the chair. Um, so I think it largely depends on the percentages. I think that um, if, a, if a recreation facility, events, culture, recreation programming, equipment, and we can we can make that category as broad, as broad as we want, but it all relates back to community sort of programming and, and service in this regard then we um, we remove some of those restrictions for future decision making. If, if council foresees a time where um, recreation facilities and that type of use is not going to be required by the community, our option is always to go to the province and say, we don't, we don't require funds for this purpose anymore. We either ask, we can identify another source of funds or we just say, we're going to tax for this and we, we need to utilize these funds elsewhere and we'll see we'll see through those discussions if that's possible with respect to roads i, I think we're it's safe to say we'll probably never have enough and, and we'll have to hope for debt servicing in that regard um, same with water same with other infrastructure needs that we have in the community so um yeah th those were just examples and those percentages at you know 50% I was so bold with that because it was talked about and supported quite a bit. Um yeah we, we council does have to consider what that might look like in the future. Uh, well for that rather than the balance the following eligible uses introducing a paid document would it not be better to have a minimum percentage because we're always for that. I mean, we always got to need a reserve from a pocket. Yeah, maybe I'll clarify what would be included in terms of eligible uses in that pay parking um, surplus fund. So we could, there were several topics that were brought forward to council that, that is outside of recreation and, and roads. So if we wanted to um, list those other, those other uses, then we can, and I'm blanking on, on what those were at the moment, but um, we could list those other uses that were brought forward and make them as sort of long or short listed as we wanted to. 
and then they can just be used for any one of those purposes, but approved by council through an annual allocation. Setting a minimum, we can we can certainly do that, um, and that may be easier to determine once we once council sees what that what that list may be, and we can we can even. Um, you know, not make a decision on, on percentages unless we feel confident about a minimum in one of these areas and the balance of the percentage can be worked out through the next discussion. Yeah. Oh, you have a question? Um, no, I think that answers. Any other thoughts? Do you want to strike that recommendation? Yeah, if there is any certainty on, on a percentage for any of those categories, that would be helpful to get policy started. If there's if there's no comfort level in terms of setting any percentages, then I'll just, we can fill in the blanks next time. Well, I mean, off the, off the top of my head, I was thinking of a minimum of 30% for recreation, um, minimum of 20% for roads infrastructure. Um, I was going to say a minimum of 5% for the pay parking reserve fund. Well, I'm happy to debate those things. Yeah, I had similar, well, not too similar, but I was thinking um, if we split it down the middle and had 35 for recreation, 35 for roads, and then that would leave 30 in the reserve fund that could then be allocated either way for that service in the future. That add up, or is my math that bad? It's, it's okay. I was just my my feeling was knowing the feeling in the community. We we need to load uh, recreation off the, right off the bat. So I would. That's why I would yeah, agree yeah. with you going thirty five, thirty five. Tom, what's your thought? Yeah, I was going to go with even higher percentage. <laughs> thirty five, but. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about at this point maybe making a, a fulsome discussion on exact uh, percentage allocations. Um, I'm a little premature, but I think you probably have uh, sufficient direction in terms of where priorities lie. It would be nice to have Mayor Law here as well, because I know he feels strongly on certain parts of this. Um, but uh, I would be reluctant to start allocating specific percentages at this point. Noting that we certainly have made it very clear that uh, recreation facilities, uh, indoor, outdoor, inclusive of uh, those recreational activities that are specifically sports orientated, uh, very strong direction from council. And I would suspect that the percentage would be higher um, for that particular area if we were to allocate a specific percentage. That probably doesn't help at all, but. Um, <laughs> It is what it is. But you can still go to a higher percentage for sure. By a minimum. Mm -hmm. By a minimum, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. That's why I was thinking if we set the minimums lower, it creates space where we can meet the minimum road. And then there would still be room to grow with the recreation facility within that area. Rather than set the minimums higher. Oh, you said 35, 35. I would, I would, I would adjust that's the 30%. I would, I would adjust the 30%. Sorry. It's very quick math. Um, but yeah, that was just my I mean, first thing. You know, it's got to be less than 100% to give you the flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. So then I would adjust the upper salary. Al, what's your thought? Well, I'm, I, I want, I'd like to see the percentage weighted in recreation facilities. So, I mean, I think we could still have a lot of flexibility of say, we allocated about 50%, broken up somewhere along the lines, maybe 25% recreation minimum, some type of 15% roads and infrastructure minimum, 10%. So I think that adds up to 50%. And then that leaves 50% to allocate each year into whichever of these reserve funds based on budget discussions. So that's quite a bit of flexibility, mm -hmm. I think. And, and still we're, we're giving some weight to the recreation yeah. facility. And so that would be my suggestion. So I'm, I'm a little more comfortable with setting a, 
giving staff direction at this point with some numbers in there to, to look at because it, this is going to go through probably at least two more readings report back to council so there's still room to to have some adjustments and discussion on those as we let that sit you know, with staff and, and see how our own minds might chew on that um i think the the lower percentage for Maryland is for sure makes sense like capital off at 50 percent and definitely the way with the recreation and maybe expanding on the the definition of the recreation kind of to include all of the arts and cultures and things maybe more of like a community health kind of definition while keeping that term for simplicity yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. So, well, I I feel like I want the higher percentage to go to recreation, like everyone else. Um, I think um, senior do more heavily weighted in that area. And um, for me, for the for the percentage to be going to existing roads and infrastructure, I feel like. I need to know what percentage is required to run the paid parking, and then I could make a better decision on the minimum percentage for that, because I, I would not like that to cost. Okay, through the chair to Councillor Solomon, this surplus would would be the net amount that's that um, covers all the annual costs of operating and providing the service to the community. So it would be revenue less all of those expenses and the surplus we're talking about is in consideration of all of those expenses. Yeah, so that would always be covered on an annual basis. And if we needed to reinvest okay. invest funds right. back into the program for the following year, we'd certainly note that to council before surplus funds were, were um, determined on an annual basis. And the surplus, there is a surplus projected for every year. So current year's amounts could be used. It just means the surplus would be a bit lower in that year. Okay. Uh, I was gonna, uh, Councillor Anderson convinced me. So I, I'd support the, the direction that Councillor Anderson to give staff a little more direction as well. And as you said, we still have a couple of kicks at the camps. Mm -hmm. So that's 25, 15 and 10, is that correct? That's what you suggested, Councillor. That's what you suggested, yeah. Okay, well, I think I can, I'll read the recommendation there. That staff be authorized to allocate paid parking program surplus funds on an annual basis as follows minimum of 25% to recreation facilities, indoor and outdoor, including debt servicing, by introducing a recreation facilities reserve fund bylaw. A minimum of 15% to the existing roads infrastructure reserve fund. What's that? Ten, a minimum of 10% to a paid parking reserve fund bylaw. For the second one. All in favor? No. All motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Is that good, Nyla? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. That was great, guys. Okay, moving on to 8.3 short term rental discussion, planning services. Good afternoon, Chair Council. Um, I just have a very brief presentation uh, to kind of continue on from the last time this was discussed. Uh, I believe that was on the 24th regular council meeting. So, a brief bit of background as I noted, today's discussion does stem from a resolution that was passed at the April 24th regular council meeting where staff provided reports. And there was a presentation again responding to a council resolution from uh, last fall. So, really, our purpose here today is, is just to provide a little bit of additional context, respond to any questions, uh, and provide any other background information that council may need uh, during the following discussion. A few of the key short-term mental points that I thought I'd bring up uh, just as, uh, as a bit of a refresher for everyone. So uh, short-term rentals, bed and breakfasts have been permitted in the 25 years, decades. Short-term rentals themselves uh, as, as nightly rentals occurring in independent units within residential homes uh, were officially permitted in uh, most district residential zones in 2005. 
Um, and the regulations have really changed a little since then. There's been some changes to language for clarity and conciseness, but largely the original regulations are still in. Uh, these regulations include a maximum of three bedrooms per short-term rental operation, uh, as or bed and breakfast operation, as the case may be, and six guests uh, with the owner, caretaker, or an operator required to reside full-time on the same lot. The short-term rental operation can be in a suite, caretaker's cottage, or a main dwelling. Uh, this is, uh, has a bit of a difference with a bed and breakfast operation, which much must occur in the same dwelling as the, the operator is living in. Um, as noted, bed and breakfast regulations are slightly different, different in terms of where the operator resides. However, they often function the same. Uh, houses can be designed to have bed and breakfast units that are uh, largely functioning uh, as separate units, however, that even though they are connected to the main dwelling. Uh, so currently there are approximately 270 short-term rental licenses uh, issued. This fluctuates a little bit depending on uh, the time of the year, um, and that equals to approximately 590 beds. Um, and about 62% of these licenses are issued to you know, addresses. Over 90% of them are issued to uh, BC addresses. Uh, so it's actually only a very small percentage of short-term rental operations that are at least licensed to um, uh, any other uh, owners outside of BC or outside of the country. Uh, so one of the things that I, I was hoping to do in this presentation was just uh, kind of reflect back to council what staff heard during the last conversation. Um, there was a lot of opinions that came out, but it was it was uh, not necessarily clear that everybody was exactly on the same page as to what was being discussed. Uh, so initially, uh, what staff were responding to was was a notice of motion to provide some background information around short-term rental business licensing and to provide a bit of a communications plan for potential discussions uh, shaped by the input of the community. Um, and discussion on the uh, April 24th meeting really seemed to start focusing on changes to the zoning bylaw, which was, was a little bit separate from what the notice of motion initially uh, requested um, uh, to restrict short-term rental permissions from the current state. That was never uh, explicitly stated, but it seemed that there was at least a little bit of a consensus, uh, at least uh, to what staff heard. Um, again, I could be wrong about this, and, and that's probably, probably why we're going to be continuing the discussion today. Um, however, just as a general comment, it seemed that there was some desire from all counselors to uh, consider changing zoning permissions in some way for short-term rental and, and breakfast operations, potentially restricting them or potentially, uh, you know, just starting by opening the conversation with the community to see if there is any desire within the community to change these regulations at this point in time. So uh, a few recommendations. Uh, again, these are very gentle recommendations. Um, Staff have not prepared a formal report for this particular committee of the whole meeting. Uh, however, again, as noted, are here mostly to provide uh, background information to council desire. Uh, but a few staff recommendations would be to um, formulate a, a clearly stated, uh, defined council desire. You know, what is it that we're looking to do here uh, as, a, as a council? What are we hoping as a community? Do we want to consider changing zoning or other bylaws to restrict short-term rental or bed and breakfast operations? Are we happy with things the way they are? Um, and, and then to direct staff accordingly. Uh, staff feel that if we would like to move forward with some certain changes, as this is a fairly significant consideration for, for many people within the community, uh, it would be a good, a good place to start with some fairly robust public consultation. Uh, following that public consultation, staff would then formulate uh, a variety of possible bylaw amendments um, uh, for council's consideration. The other thing that is worth noting is that we are kind of planning to begin a much larger full zoning bylaw overhaul scheduled to begin uh, this fall. So realistically, the process to change SDR permissions, uh, again, is a fairly significant part of the zoning bylaw. Uh, so it, it would probably not begin until the fall. Uh, myself, I'm, I'm sort of only partially working at the moment. Um, and uh, there, it's, it's a little bit challenging to go through a lot of public consultation during the summer here in Tofino. Most of the community is fairly busy. Uh, either running the business or working um, and, and uh, enjoying the place that we live in here as well. Uh, so staff would likely not begin any public consultation, whether uh, to do with a larger zoning bylaw overhaul or to do with a more specific consideration of short-term rental permissions until the fall. Um, and and these short-term rental permissions are likely a part of a significant part of this larger zoning bylaw overhaul. So. Uh, well, it may be faster to really focus if council's desire is to really focus on short-term rental regulations, it's likely faster because this is a, a smaller consideration than the entire zoning bylaw. Uh, it would be a faster approach to, to direct staff to focus specifically on this at this point in time. Um, uh, it may push the overall zoning bylaw kind of overall project back a little bit due to staff capacity. Um, 
uh, however, um, you know, things would maybe change a little bit faster. That was the, the desire of council. Uh, at this point in time, staff are of the opinion that uh, if we're going to be moving through an entire zoning bylaw overhaul that will have robust public consultation, it may be uh, that we just uh, simply flag short-term rentals as, as a significant part of this conversation with the community going forward. Um, uh, and, and we take our time to move through that. However, uh, if this is a significant topic for council that they would like to see move forward a little bit more quickly, um, uh, staff are happy to uh, focus just on that at this point in time and then worry about uh, rest of the bylaw perhaps at a, a few months later or, or sometime in 2024. Uh, so a quick look at some general community engagement. This is kind of repeating what was already discussed uh, at, at the April 24th meeting. An, an initial approach would likely take place of, you know, online surveys, talk to, you know, uh, some sort of very basic engagement approaches to just generally take the temperature of the community regarding short-term mental operations and then to try to really focus in on what's seen as, as, the, as the challenges, what's seen as the benefits. Uh, following this uh, would likely be beneficial to actually host some in-person workshops, information sessions, open houses, those sorts of things, you know, kind of all different names for, for similar, similar activities. Um, and it may potentially be useful to establish an advisory committee uh, with a staff liaison as well as a council liaison, um, uh, whether this is for a short-term rental specific amendment or for an overall zoning, uh, kind of uh, look at the overall zoning bylaw, uh, a steering committee can be very helpful to, to kind of focus in on, on specific shareholders within the community to get some good advice from them. Uh, so that's essentially my very brief presentation today. Um, and again, if there are any uh, questions or, or things that are, that are uh, remain unanswered from previous discussions, uh, I'm here to, to try to help as well as uh, your staff members. Thanks. Um, I guess my question is around the zoning bylaw overall, is, is it, the focus of that is that an update or is it the I, I know we've looked at the updating the zoning bylaw, but we're calling it an overhaul now. So I, I'm guessing it's 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 a little more work than than what we looked at before. Uh, what's do we know what we're looking at for for that process? And, and what are some of the aims of the process? Is it to bring resigning bylaw in line with the OCP? Is it to bring it in line with new provincial regulations? Is it to just to update it in general? But maybe if you could provide any comment on that, that'd be great. Through the chair, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Anderson. Uh, our zoning bylaw was established in 1997, so uh, the community was uh, significantly different place then than it is now. Uh, it's typically good uh, practice to try to update your zoning bylaw following a significant OCP change, which occurred in 2021 for us. Uh, our OCP that we're, that's currently active is, is a bit of a departure from our previous OCPs in that it's uh, a little bit uh, more restrictive than, than previous OCPs have been. Um, I would note that a lot of the, the central kind of goals of the OCP have remained the same for, for decades at this point. Uh, however, we've been a little bit more focused on those goals, I would say, now uh, through our current language in our OCP. Uh, and our zoning bylaw doesn't necessarily uh, line up with, with the goals that we've established in the OCP. Uh, one of the things that it doesn't line up very well uh, through is, is our short-term rental regulations. Uh, within our OCP, we are looking to uh, largely curtail, restrict short-term rental operations within uh, residential areas of the community. And our zoning bylaw still um, uh, allows, in many residential zones, uh, short-term rental operations to continue. So that's just one example of how our zoning bylaw doesn't exactly line up with our OCP. Um, uh, I, I, sorry, I, I hope the language isn't uh, confusing. I, I call it an overhaul because that was the word that came to mind when I was creating these slides. It, it doesn't necessarily mean anything in particular. It just means we're trying to um, really update our zoning bylaw in a, in a significant way. Um, uh, since 1997, there have been many zoning bylaw amendments, so just small changes to certain parts of the zoning bylaw. Uh, but this is an opportunity for uh, kind of a whole meal deal approach to the zoning bylaw, where we uh, actually rewrite everything from, from start to finish and everything from the definitions to the different land uses um, uh, through all the way to you know, our, our various appendices and things like that at the back. Um, so it's, it's a much more comprehensive consideration of the zoning bylaw. It's much more involved. Uh, because it is much more involved, it does take time. 
Um, so that's why this particular process, uh, we're hoping to begin it this fall, and then it would probably continue well into 2024. There's usually, it's similar to, to an OCP, maybe maybe you know a little bit more specific and, and, and a little bit more contained by provincial legislation. However, it does require a large amount of public consultation, uh, just so we make sure that we're we're getting things uh, where we're both lined up with our OC people who are also responding to the needs of the community. Um, uh, so I, I mentioned short-term rentals uh, as, as one way uh, that the zoning bylaw is not particularly lining up with our OCP currently. There are a number of other ones. Uh, however, that's that's one that gets a lot of attention at this particular point in time. Um, uh, to do this larger uh, zoning bylaw rewrite, which is uh, within our financial plan that's, that's been budgeted for, uh, it would take it will take a significant amount of time if we uh, maybe decide to push that back a little bit and focus instead on just the short term rental aspects of the zoning bylaw and look to change those. Uh, there's a good chance that we can do that significantly faster. Um, however, uh, we're still hoping to rewrite that zoning bylaw at some point, so that'll just push that project maybe uh, another eight months out or ten months out or something along those lines. Thanks. Um. Would it be possible in the meantime to change the bylaws so that people have to be residents of Tofino to get a business license for a short-term rental? Is that something we could do in the kind of immediate timeline and then focus on bigger picture things down the road? I just feel like the temperature of the town has just been that we've dragged our feet on this and we're talking about pushing into the fall and a bigger thing, which means it's going to be next year before we really take any actions on things. and. I get a lot of frustration from people on this issue and that we've made zero movement on it in their eyes. I understand there's lots of work going on behind the scenes, but people aren't really seeing that. And I think that we kind of need to do something now rather than saying, hey, we're going to just like push things down another year, which will probably be two years, which will probably be, you know, you know how things go. So I, I would like to see something of that nature. Yeah, to the chair, thank you for the question, Councillor Thomas. Uh, zoning bylaws really belong to council. So council can provide direction to staff at any time to change bylaws in any way they would like. Uh, the reason that, that staff are uh, potentially cautioned council to, to take that approach, at least at this point, uh, is because this is a fairly significant issue for the community. There's, there's both uh, challenges and benefits that come from short-term rentals. Um, so uh, the decisions that are made at, at the council table, um, particularly the decisions that are made without much public consultation, uh, may or may not accurately reflect uh, the reality of the community or, or the various desires within the community. There's, there's been many times when I've been, in my mind, quite sure of something and then have realized that I was actually uh, completely wrong or maybe not completely wrong, but at least a little bit. So, so that's why, uh, again, I... I uh, Sorry, I apologize if I'm coming across strong. I'm really not trying to, to um, uh, tell council in any way the action that they should take. However, uh, typically uh, for, for uh, you know, large zoning changes or large changes of this nature, which, which walk back uh, or could walk back potential uh, permissions that have been in place for, for a long time that are a significant part of many people's uh, income in this town, um, uh, without doing some sort of public consultation, I, I would I would caution council to be too aggressive. However, uh, any uh, these things are all entirely possible. Uh, and and if uh, there's some specific direction that council would like to give planning staff at this point, we're more than happy to go and uh, at least draft some bylaws or draft some considerations that we can bring back. And, and if council would like to move forward with uh, some interim changes, um, uh, then uh, just to you know take some action on the issue, as you noted. Uh, then any direction you give us wouldn't work to, to bring it back as quickly as possible. Um, just through the chair, um, I think if we were at least to do it, that it needs to be you know residents. I think people should still have to live on the on the actual land, but maybe we don't go that extreme to start with because everybody's going to be grandfathered in anyway who already has those, like who lives in BC or lives elsewhere and already has it and they're operating it. We understand they're grandfathered and we're not taking anything away from people. And we're not taking anything away from locals in doing this. We're just saying, hey, we're putting it out in the world and we're talking about changing the things. And other people might say, okay, well, we're going to get in now and buy things and do this. And so I think we put a stopgap measure on that in the meantime. But that's, that's I've got strong feelings on that. <laughs> I kind of agree with uh, Dr. Thomas. 
Uh, Tofino resident, somebody whose address is in Tofino, the permanent residency is Tofino. Um, it'd be a slightly dissenting voice, only in the fact that I'm a little cautious about taking an approach that would be piecemeal. Uh, rather than a more comprehensive approach. And I understand there is a, a desire within the community of action on, on short-term rentals. Um, I, I, I personally would, uh, I think the, the temperature of the community is such that um, a more comprehensive plan um, is more appropriate, uh, inclusive in that uh, full zoning bylaw review, which we've been talking about for some time. Um, Things have been funded for some time, but anyways, uh, I would like to see it as part of that more comprehensive approach overall um, in terms of the interim. I, I think we have to stop and think about what was the purpose of, of why we were um, very much engaged in the SDR property um, conversation. Uh, a lot of that had to do with uh, the housing issue in general. Um, so uh, the number of 270 STRs certainly uh, impacts our ability to provide housing to locals. So that was one of the major issues that we approached this with um, uh, neighborhood change of character within SDRs within neighborhoods. I can speak to my neighborhood specifically. Um, and then there were uh, concerns, uh, legitimate concerns to allow access to locals to participate and engage in the tourism economy uh, to be able to afford to live in this community. So uh, when I stop and think about the overall objective of what we were addressing the SDRs, I think it would be much more appropriate to address it as a more comprehensive issue um, and then to approach it in, in a very piecemeal uh, fashion. Although I do understand the, the, uh, the need to in essence, placate the community with direct action, but there has been tremendous action uh, on this particular file that may not be seen uh, at the community level. So, um, I, I would be reluctant to to engage in that uh, in this process at this time. Uh, yeah, I just maybe maybe uh, Peter just uh, quickly, what were you hoping to get out uh, of this uh, in terms of direction? Or was there any? <laughs> oh, there was that. Do, do it, Jamie. Uh, thank you, Councillor Steer. Uh, at this point, um, uh, there was there was no real uh, requests that came into staff uh, from the from the last you know kind of deferring the discussion to this particular meeting. Um, uh, so so staff are more than happy to kind of uh, assist council in any direction that they would like to move with this. Whether it's at this point in time to to uh, I suppose. Um, uh, the, the choices that are between council as far as, as approaches to take would be to uh, a direct staff to uh, immediately begin looking at uh, at, at changes to um, uh, bylaw permissions within the zoning bylaw specifically, but also within the business licensing bylaw. Uh, another would be to uh, direct staff to um, uh, continue to engage with the community in order to inform these uh, types of decisions, and and maybe a third would be to. Uh, delay any significant changes or, or any changes at all until uh, the more robust uh, zoning bylaw review uh, is, is scheduled to occur uh, starting this fall. Um, again, uh, well, that is uh, likely probably the most uh, uh, you know, wholesome way to approach this kind of an issue. I, I do recognize that is a bit of a slower way to approach the issue as well. Um, and then maybe the fourth option would be to, to do something that I haven't mentioned already. Uh, however, I would say uh, what staff are looking for if, if we're looking for anything would be uh, clear clear direction I suppose as to um, actions that that council would like us to take in terms of uh, either preparing potential uh, bylaw changes uh, we, we would prepare a, a you know, probably a suite of amendments that you know based on the discussion uh, hopefully uh, kind of uh, based on the direction that council gets us hopefully the uh, kind of hits the mark in terms of what council is looking for or or uh, if, if uh, council would like us first to begin with um, some some uh, communications uh, as well as as well as other consultation exercises, uh, we could start there and then bring the, the results of those back to council as well. Um, I suppose the major difference between all these choices is just the amount of time it takes. All right. Um, although I certainly have heard the same feedback that other councillors have and share many of the same views. I do think that I would 
not be in favor of a knee-jerk reaction of limiting licenses immediately. Um, just because I see that as a you know shutting the barn door after the horse is out sort of thing. Um, I do think we need to look at our bylaws and our zoning. I fully support that. And however that changes, we do need community engagement before we do that. And as much as it kills me to say it, because I would like everything to happen sooner, I think that rushing it would send the wrong message and it wouldn't allow for a fulsome discussion on the matter. Um, my one question is with the review beginning in the fall, when would we see completion of the zoning bylaw amendments or for help? Through the chair, thank you for the question, Councillor Sawyer. Uh, it's a little bit of a difficult one to answer. Uh, it sort of depends on, on uh, how soon we're able to get into things. Um, I would like to say that we would be looking to kind of adopt the voting by law. You know, realistically, it wouldn't be till the end of 2024. So these these are fairly long processes. Um, uh, a typical zoning member, if somebody, a private landowner came to us and then looked to rezone things and they had all their ducks in a row, it usually takes us about a, about a year to get through. Um, I would say this larger overhaul of the of the zoning bylaw, which would mostly be done in house, but probably with some support from outside consultants, uh, I would expect uh, you know a few months at least for for public consultation activities, and then we would likely begin to uh, bring kind of drafts of various sections of it for, for to committee of the whole meetings for council review uh, before bringing it uh, you know kind of wholesale in as a, as a bylaw. Um, it would be. A fairly slow and involved process, uh, but the goal being that we actually are able to uh, respond to the community's needs as well as um, uh, kind of bring the bylaw to council and just make sure that we're getting it right before we actually look for it. Because it's a it's a fairly significant bylaw to to grant readings to all at once in the same way that an OCP is. So we we'll probably follow a, a very similar process to our most recent OCP, which was to uh, bring you know sections of the, the bylaw to, to council for for initial review and then. Uh, you know, likely in the fall of 2024, try to actually consolidate all those into one large bylaw and bring it forward for readings. Hopefully at that point, uh, you know, the document's fairly familiar to council, so it's nothing super overwhelming at that point, but I would expect, uh, realistically speaking, the earliest we could get uh, the, the larger kind of zoning bylaw project done would be, uh, you know, towards the end of 2024, starting uh, in the fall of 2023. Uh, if we were to be very specific and, and target just uh, you know the short-term rental aspects of the zoning bylaw, um, again, likely not starting until the fall, uh, we may be able to shave six months or so off that timeline and then look at uh, some some changes to the zoning bylaw in, in the you know spring or early summer of 2024. That was kind of you know, of course ballpark ranges, mm -hmm. but but maybe give you a little bit of an idea about the the sort of the timelines or the difference in the timelines that we would be considering. All right, uh, one quick follow up if I may. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's fairly reasonable. Can I ask um, through the chair if you could possibly foresee that process being dragged on any longer than that, just given that I would hate to. Um, lump it in with everything and then find out that something else has come up and now it will be 2026 because well I don't think we necessarily need to rush this I don't know I can yeah what's the sorry I can speak it but I don't need thank you um I'm just a little reluctant to have staff answer questions regarding timelines um at, at this stage and one reason for that is when we enter a, a process that, it, that involves public consultation and dare I bring up a parking, but I'm going to, um, it sometimes extends those timelines a little bit. And, and my experience sitting in this chair and my previous role as CFO is I've watched our community and, and council go through processes very productively and carefully, like the OCP, uh, and we come out with a with a good product in the end, one that has strong community buy-in. Um, it meets and aligns well with the objectives of the community. And I think this zoning rewrite process it will be just as important as important as that, and and if not more, because of the gravity of the issue that we're that we're talking about here today. It's something that touches many members of our community and businesses, and I think we. 
um, as your CAO, I think I am providing you with some advice in, and I have spoken to staff about this and that's why we are coming forward and, and sort of suggesting we let it go through the zoning rewrite process. Through that process, we will have the opportunity to provide council with the data that they are requesting to make informed decisions. We will also be able to respond to the community consultation that we receive on matters outside of STRs, but within STRs, and we can have a fulsome discussion about it. And I believe that the product that we come out with at the end would be one that would be supported by, by council and the community, hopefully. And given the general timelines provided by staff today, I think um, if we're looking at another six months for something like that, I think it's, it's well worth the effort based on my experience. I'm probably against you that. I'm, just, <laughs> my turn. Yeah, <laughs> I'm probably against you that. I mean, when we talk about knee jerk reaction, this this topic of discussion has been going on for all the time I've been on council. That's so that's you know 15 years or so. So it's you know pretty poor reflex as if it's a knee jerk reaction. I think. I think uh, short-term rentals is the hot topic. I think it needs to be moved to the front burner. Uh, and we need to see something move on it. Having said that, I realize this is uh, short-term rentals, benefits a lot of people in this community, enables them to live in this community. So I don't want to see people uh, not be able to get a short-term rental if they buy a house. And uh, I, want, I have, I argue with you guys, a best look trying to prove who's the local. I mean, that's a really complicated thing. Um, I'd like to see us look at having, only being able to have one short-term rental per family or business, but whether that's business licensing or zoning. Um, and, you know, we can look at locals only, but I think that's going to be really difficult. And you're basically talking about the down zoning, and I think that's just going to be a nightmare. I don't know whether that'll be ever achieved. That. So that's just my opinion. All right, do you want to go around the table again? Let's start with Kat. Yeah, I'm <laughs> Do you want to go ahead? No, you go ahead. That's all good. I go. Yeah, I'm suggesting what you said. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think if short term rentals became part of the zoning, the larger zoning process, um, it would take up a good chunk of the public consultation, anyways. It would have to be separated out and dealt with. Um, in inside of that process, so I mean, one one, one approach might be to sort of uh, do that at the front of of that process and and provide some answers that would both assist in the zoning rewrite overhaul, whatever you call it, um, and and then sort of put that to to rest to some extent at the beginning of that process. Um, I think it does need to be dealt with up, up front somehow, whether it's part of the process or if it's separated out. Um, I'm, I'm kind of in favor of, of separating it out. And, and I, otherwise it, it may flavor the whole rest of the zoning re, rewrite. I don't, I don't know how, but I could see that that <laughs> the public consultation around that could influence how people participate in the rest of the zoning um, rewrite if, if uh, it takes up too much energy or if it takes a certain direction, and leaves a certain flavor <laughs> to the rest of the process. So there's, there's I, I, I'm kind of in favor of separating it out. Um, that I, I think also the goals, and I don't don't know if every councillor agrees with this, but there's there's certain goals that council has stated around the short term rentals that are really not part necessarily of the rest of that zoning process. I think that that council and the community are worried about the, just the 
proliferation overall of short-term rentals, where does it stop kind of question is out there. How many will we end up with? Will that be the only way to own a property in the future? Um, so that's one question. Impact on neighborhoods is another question. Uh, whether it should be an owner operated kind of model uh, or local, some sort of model. Uh, should it be a model like a BNB &B was originally kind of designed where it was meant to be the, the resident, maybe the owner as well, operating that business. Um, and then also the, the questions of, and, and goals, from my perspective anyway, on short-term rental, it's about enforcement of whatever we do. And our bylaws currently in this, this sort of model where there's a, uh, you know, a suite or a cabin or part of the house or something needs to be occupied by a long-term resident, that is really hard to enforce as we've seen. Um, an owner-operated model could cover that off a lot better and be easier to enforce, I think, than, than the current model because somebody may have a long-term lease, they may break it. You don't know for sure if somebody's sort of been placed there carefully <laughs> to, to sort of be removed later and then the whole thing, the whole property turns into a larger two uh, unit kind of operation. And those are the kind of things that we really struggle to enforce. So enforcement is, is part of the goal. Um, the participation of locals in the tourism economy is part of the goal. The, um, uh, Also, the, the non-proliferation, I think, is part of the goal, having some sort of a uh, an end in sight. Um, and, and I mean, so, some of these rules could be uh, altered without necessarily removing that use altogether in so-called downzoning or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I, to deal with those kind of things, I kind of think the short-term rental is an issue and is a, and is a zoning or, or bylaw related question it needs to be kind of isolated somehow, either at the front end of a, that process or just dealt with first and then move on with the zoning thing. The other sort of thing that comes to mind is that the province is currently overriding zoning bylaws in some places in an effort to to get some more residential zoning approvals and, and it's mainly targeted at larger municipalities and urban centers but um there i think as we move in into that zoning bylaw question that rewrite i think some of those kind of questions about uh, how to get more residential in there, how to get more some more affordable residential into the whole zoning picture might be best dealt with separate for rentals as well. So those are my comments. I'll just cap it off with, I would like to see it dealt with sooner rather than um, I would not be satisfied with leaving this as being resolve potentially maybe at the end of 2024. I think this is a separate issue. It's something that's talked about every election season. It's something that we've all voiced opinions on along the way. And I do think it's something that should be taking a priority right now. Um, I, I would still support a more comprehensive approach. Um, because we also have tools. One of the one of the things that has come up, and I and I hear about the proliferation. And one of the we do have tools in terms of new proposals that come before council. Almost all new uh, proposals that have come forward, we have been very clear that STRs will not be allowed in those. So we have already indicating, um, and we have tools um, to stop that proliferation. I think the number. Um, 
of new SDRs under the current uh, ability to do it uh, is going to be limited. Um, case in point, uh, there are not that many uh, that would be fitting into that category in terms of this large proliferation coming forward. Um, I don't know who can afford to do it. But anyways, so we do have tools to stop that non-proliferation. I can think of many of the proposals that have come forward. We've been very clear as a council um, that there will be no SDRs involved in those. Uh, taking a look, uh, I, you know, I, I can move forward a bit with Councillor Anderson's suggestion of a front-loaded process where we have that as almost a, um, uh, I mean, I don't want to be speculative about how the community would uh, respond to it, but I think if we have it at the front-loaded end, recognizing that it would be a significant component uh, of the overhaul and zoning, because it's not just a zoning issue that uh, the SDRs company. So uh, I would not be um, uh, delaying our, our overhaul process. I would have this inclusive of that and have it at that front loaded end um, in terms of direction. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, we'll just hear the rest of council and, and how they feel. Um, I would uh, also support um, separating the STR zoning from the main body, although it will um, lengthen the whole process, which I sympathize with the uh, staff time and everything. I'm hearing some pretty strong voices around the council table and whatever that outcome may be, I do feel a priority needs to be community, community engagement. I don't want anyone to feel that, uh, their voices aren't heard, but I'm also hearing that we have talked about this for a long time and people feel ready to move on it um, with all due process sooner rather than later. With regards to community engagement, would that process start this summer? Uh, if we were, thanks if we were focusing on short term. Yeah, uh, certainly that, that could be something that begins this summer. Um, uh, the reason staff are sometimes hesitant to begin public consultation in the summer is, is largely because uh, the town is quite busy in the summer, and so it's you, you, it's often more challenging to get people to respond to public consultation and invites uh, during the summertime. Uh, however, uh, if, if this uh, is something that council would like to prioritize, that's certainly something that can be done. The reason I suggested summer, I suspect it's going to be like a prairie fire this summer. It will be the right time to be asking people's opinions when they're pretty hot under the collar about it. Rather than when in the winter when half of them have gone to Mexico. So I would be in support of doing a public consultation in the summer. And hopefully we get the same sort of response as we did for pay parking where people got pretty concerned. Holly. To add to your observations there, also I think being in stage two water restrictions already, it would be pertinent in the summer to also see what our short-term rental effects are and how people are noticing that as well. So I'd agree with the summer. Somebody thought on that. So oh, no, you haven't been yet. Oh, no, no, not but a different subject. Go ahead. Um, does the municipality have any like positioning to uh, um, kind of influence the provincial government to encourage the speculation tax to come here because that could slow down the proliferation of steers? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I believe that would be something probably best suited for UBCM or, or something of that nature. Um, we can maybe I'll defer to our CAO. Yes, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, that's the that's the best uh, avenue that the municipality has to to liaise with provincial government representatives. I can send more information to council on that after the meeting. People I know that own second homes and things have no concerns about paying an extra one percent speculation tax. It's just no, I know, but if. Like we're looking at someone investing here for a short-term rental that's not going to live here. They, and I think Qualcomm has it now, then they might be more. Qualcomm doesn't have it. Maybe Nanaimo does. Then they might be more encouraged to buy one here. 
Well, I'm hearing, apart from yourself, that most people want to bring short-term rentals to the forefront and that uh, public consultation should start in the summer. Is there anything else you're wanting from us? Uh, not at this time, unless... Uh... But and do you want to come back with a plan? Yeah, I'm not sure if we would look for a specific uh, resolution at this time or if we're comfortable uh, you know, to our legislative services staff or our CAO if, if we need to craft a resolution at this point. Or if we have I'd like to see you come back with a sort of work plan just to see what's feasible rather than us laying down the law too much. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to comment on process. I, it would it would be good to have a resolution from council so we can track the action on this item. Um, I, I just want to, to be very clear to council that this will extend out the zoning bylaw, bylaw rewrite process because we won't be including it in that, which means two, two consultation processes, more reports to council and us having to, you know, delay one to prioritize the other. Um, so we're not looking at front loading it as part of the zoning rewrite process. We'd be looking at it entirely separately and then work plans would entirely shift. And so um, that's that's what I'm hearing from council. And I think a, a clear resolution from council asking us to, um, to proceed in that fashion. Uh, maybe I will just have this moment to ask staff if we want some more direction on what to consult on specifically. The community, or do we have enough information on that? Uh, I, I, thank you. I, I think I think I have a, a pretty good understanding of, of where where council is headed at this point in time. I think maybe what we would start with, uh, uh, unless I'm mistaken, please correct me. It would be uh, at this point not be getting a consultation until we brought back a bit more of a formal report to council outlining uh, sort of a timeline and consultation activities, and then uh, you know potential timelines for bringing uh, you know, a suite of amendments for, for council to choose from back uh, potentially in the fall or winter. Um, is that uh, sort of along the lines of what we're aware of? Uh, the idea of that consultation taking place in the summer? Yeah, so so the, the idea being that uh, this you know, sort of report outlining work plan comes, comes back to council you know, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm... I am concerned about the summer timeline for consultation, given the limited resources and planning. I think that Peter is is being very kind and respectful and saying that it that it may be possible with his limited work schedule. Uh, we have one council meeting coming up with council on June thirteenth, and then um, there is a, a break until until July. And the likelihood of getting something before council on June thirteenth is quite low. So reports were due last Friday. Um, so earliest we could get in front of council is is the meeting in July, um, getting the work plan approved and then putting together the, the consultation to be released. It's likely not going to happen until end of August. I would say at the earliest. And so I really want to set council's expectations and I'm, I could be being generous on time. I know all the other things that are on the work plan in that department and is very limited in terms of resourcing. So um, summer would, would be a stretch for us and we will do it as quickly as possible, but through the chair, I'd also um, like to share the concern with the summer timeline, um, having done a fair bit of public engagement over the years with various projects, Summer is really difficult and to host an open house or you know, have a, a talk to Pino page that's out for 30 days and expect someone who's working 14 hour shifts to make time to come to that open house, I think is not maybe fair to, um, to the constituents. Uh, so while we could start it in the summer, if, if we can, if resources would allow, then I, I suggest that it taper into September when there's a little bit more breathing room and we might be able to have a, a bit more of a conversation with those folks that can't always come out to a, an evening meeting or an afternoon meeting. I seem to remember when we were discussing the marijuana issue, we had the open house in the middle of the summer and that was the most, that was the biggest open house we ever had. Mm -hmm. Free snacks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't yeah. find that argument when people won't come out in the summer. I think mean, this is a pretty hot topic. Um, I, I'll bet you right now, You'll have more input on short term rentals than you will on the whole zoning bylaw. So you can tell I'm pretty agitated about it. <laughs> yeah, it, 
if I may, to be clear, staff are not arguing in terms of commenting on timelines and what may be most acceptable by the community. I think we're only speaking from experience, and I think going into the fall would not be a disadvantage to council. It would be an advantage. It would open up the timeline for more feedback. I'm happy with all this. I would concede to August, yes. You'll concede to August. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, else? Yeah, I, obviously, I'm, I'm not supportive of, of the, the rest of the councils at this point, and no resolutions has been passed. But um, I, I do want to thank staff for um, and appreciate a, a realistic assessment because I think it's important for Kelsa to understand um, the components that go with that are involved in this process. Uh, and so I do appreciate staff uh, bringing that forward uh, to give us a realistic understanding of what uh, can be done in the timeframes that are being suggested. So um, I, I would uh, I, I won't be supporting uh, this moving forward. Um, but that being said, I, I would hope council would, would listen to uh, the realistic realities of what our staff can deliver uh, if the time constraints that, uh, being, that are being imposed. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'd be happy to have staff um, present this back to council within a reasonable working frame, whether that's end of August or September, um, understanding that there will be vacations and people will be away. So I'm hearing the importance of it being in summer. For me, summer can still mean before Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, I think we and opinions is expressed um, around the table, but I staff is looking for a motion, and I sort of thought of one. Oh, so I haven't written it down, but uh, I think we're looking to ask staff to report to council um, on SDR. Uh, your view would that be enough? Uh, um, um, and a public consultation process. So mm -hmm. that, that's about all we're asking for. Um, I think to to absolutely nail down the timelines might be asking a, a bit too much. Uh, to there will be there may be things. Uh, but we're asking the team <laughs> to pivot and focus on this um, to to accomplish uh, to you know put together a plan and and deliver to the public enough material to digest and comment on in the middle of summer. So um, you know as much as I, it may be good to do that, I think if we just leave it that we're asking for a report that will deal with reviewing the SDR use and public consultation process. Then we'll hear more and we have more time to think about how that will play out and staff will have more time to look at it in depth and uh, advise council what they think too. So, yeah, but um, I, I don't think Council or staff came entirely prepared just to make that decision bang today. So, yeah, a more uh, general direction for staff would probably be appropriate. I'm in favor of more direct direction. I came here prepared to talk about short term rentals today because it was on the agenda and it came in with a clear idea of. It being a priority for us. I'm kind of aligned with Kat. I don't mind asking staff to come back, but I'd like to say, encourage them to look at the timelines council is thinking of. I mean, if that's impossible, that's fine. But I know myself, if I'm given a job and you give them, you know, please try and do it by this time you're trying to work, find a way of doing it. If you can't do it, well, come back and tell us. How does that sound? Okay. 
the eyelids were bristling. Nope. <laughs> I like Kat's term of direct direction. <laughs> that was a very direct direction. <laughs> Is that, is that Al's resolution good enough, knowing, knowing the way council feels? I haven't moved it. Yeah, no, no, that's why I'm asking if he's happy with it. Yeah, I think, I think the, the language is, is probably close enough for us to get an understanding that council would like staff to report back with a, a communication strategy uh, for uh, further uh, consultation and engagement looking at specifically short term rental conditions within various. I mean, I hate that's, that's a, that's crazy that's smart, can't sell an easy timeline and things like that. But I mean, you know the way the council feels. So why don't you make the motion next time? Okay. Um, I'll move that the committee rec Do we have to recommend us to council and go? It's okay. We'll add that part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, committee recommend that uh, staff report to council. Um, on the uh, review of short-term rentals and public consultation process uh, with, um, well, I, th I think I'll just leave it there because staff has heard that the timelines are important. So. Yeah, you're happy with that, Kat? That's, you know, I think <laughs> we've delivered the message. Do you have a second one, that? Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Yeah. On finished business, do you have any questions? Thank you, Chair McMaster. No questions at the moment. I will do one final call for anyone attending via Zoom or in the gallery would like to make a comment or ask a question of council. You can do so now using question and answer on Zoom. You need to state your name, your address, and the agenda item you're speaking to. So calling once, calling twice, calling three times, and there is no questions at this period. A motion for chair. Move adjourned. All those in favor? Move the chair. So I should calm down. <laughs>